let's go ahead and get started. One of the very hardest parts of 207 for me is to remember how hard electric fields can be. I've done this for so long that they just seem natural to me. They just seem simple and, and it just makes sense. But I have to keep reminding myself that this is your, your first kick at the can. And uh, sometimes, as the Germans say, alle Anfangs sind schwer, all beginnings are hard. And uh, this is something that is uh, challenging to get your, your brain wrapped around. Now we're gonna take a second kick at the can today. I'm gonna go back and try to make this intuitive. And uh, what that means is that some of you are going to be bored. If you've already figured it out, today's lecture is going to bore you but I don't apologize, okay? I think some of us need it. There are a couple of principles that you need to have down cold. First of all, this electric force is acting on this charge here in the formula. This is the definition of the electric field. That's the test charge. And this electric field is created by all the other nearby charges that aren't the test charge. The test charge doesn't push on himself. It's the other charges that set up the field. Now, because these charges, the one here and the one in the back of the room, are pushing or pulling on each other, they have to take turns being the Klingon and the Captain Kirk. When I'm worried about the force on this charge, it's the Captain Kirk, it's the test charge, and the other charge, the source. When I'm worried about the force on that one back there, it's the test charge, it's the Captain Kirk, and the one up here is taking its turn to be the Klingon or the source. And so, it often comes down to which one is acting as a source. And that's what we're going to concentrate on today. One thing that I need us to get down... But if there's only the two charges acting on each other, by the third law, isn't the force equal? They are. They are. And we'll get to that a little bit later today. Often there's more than two. And so we have to worry about more than one Klingon. Now, something that you can take to the bank. The electric field will always, always, always be away from a positive source. Because think about what an electric field is. An electric field, first of all, what's it at the X here? What, what is at the X? Nothing. Empty space. Nothing at all. That X is just a placeholder. The electric field has some waffle words. The electric force, is, the electric field is the force that would act at that X if I were to reach into my pocket and pull out a one coulomb, a plus one coulomb, and put it there. But I didn't really. That would kill me. I just do it with my mind. In my mind. Okay? I pretend to put a plus one coulomb there. Now, if this is positive and that's positive, how is this going to be affected? Is it going to be pushed that way or pulled that way? It's going to be pushed away. It's always going to be away from a positive source. On the other hand, it's always going to be towards a negative source. Again, I pretend to reach into my pocket, I pretend to pull out a plus one coulomb, and I ask what force would it have felt had I really done it? And since this is positive and that's negative, it would be an attraction. So, that much you can hold on to. If it's feeling like there's just too much, there's too many ideas, those are only two. The electric field is always away from a positive source towards a negative source. If you miss that on the exam, we can't, we'll try, but we can't feel sorry for you. Okay? We can't. It's too easy. 
you go to an anatomy class, you gotta remember what, there's 16 bones in the body? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Okay, the size of this field is given by Coulomb's law. I'll write that on the board. Okay. Now, in three dimensions, and that's what we're going to be dealing with in these problems, it's impossible to name one direction the negative direction, and one direction the positive direction. That leaves an infinity minus two directions to name, and I'm going to run out of names. So what we're going to do when we use this formula is we're going to use it to find the strength of the electric field, the magnitude how strong it is. That's always a positive quantity. And so we never put the sign of the, of the source charge into that equation. Okay? So, let me move this over here. Now, the hardest part about using this equation is knowing which charge in the problem is the Klingon, is the source. How do you recognize the Klingon? Well, that's what they look like. <laughs> okay, now I've got a handout here that's going to help you to recognize the Klingon. definition of the electric field, that first equation. And if you put this equation and that equation together, what you get is that force equation that looks like the gravitational force. So this would be the test charge here. And that's the source charge? Yes, yeah, see, the, the electric field is this, and this, and this, 
And if you multiply that by the test charge, you get the, the force. The big Q is the source charge? I'm sorry? The big Q is the source charge? Yes. The little Q is the test charge. However, in problems, I might not give you that hint. I might not make the source charge capital and the test charge uh, <coughs> lower case. Indeed, in this handout, you're going to find that the different charges take turns being the test charge. And so we have to do a careful reading of the problem to determine which is the test charge and which is the source charge. Let's start with this part A. We have two charges that are separated by 20 centimeters. One is a positive 3 nanocoulombs, nano being 10 to the minus 9, and one is a negative 6 nanocoulombs, or negative 6 times 10 to the minus 9. Now, listen carefully to the wording of this question. What is the electric field strength, the magnitude of the electric field, at the location of Q1 due to Q2. Now in this formula for the electric field, I have K, which is 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. I have room for one charge. And the question is, if I'm answering this question here, which charge, Q1 or Q2, do I care about? Which charge is the source creating the field? Now another way of asking it is, would this change the problem at all? Could I rewrite the problem to say, what is the electric field strength at the location of the elephant due to Q2. Would that be the same question that I had before? Yeah, Q1 was just a placeholder. It was, it was an old stump on the side of the road. Okay, now I'm using an elephant instead. What should be clear to everyone is that the words due to Q2 make it the Klingon in this problem. It is the source, it is creating the field it is a Q that goes into my formula. And when I put it into the formula, I put it in as a positive value. 6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. I don't put a minus sign there because I'm looking for the strength. Now, let's do that. Let's get rid of the elephant, get rid of Q1, and put an X there. The X again is just a placeholder, an address, a number on a mailbox. Now, if this is my source and it's a negative source, the electric field over here at the X is going to point what way? Towards the negative source. Okay? And the size is going to be given by Coulomb's law, where we plug in the charge as a positive value because we already know the direction we're looking for the magnitude. And what we get when we put that in our calculator is 1,350 newtons for each coulomb to the right. Now remember, the interaction between Q1 and Q2 is a two-step dance. Okay, We just did the first step of the two-step. The first step. Now that Q2 has set up a field at the location of Q1, we ask part B. What force does Q1 experience? Now folks, I find that a lot of people have a hard time understanding the direction of the force. It comes from this vector equation here. If the electric field is to the right and the test charge, the thing that's being pushed, is a positive test charge, then the force is going to be in the positive right direction. 
if the electric field is to the right and the test charge, the thing being pushed, is a negative charge, then the force, the actual push or pull, is going to be in the negative right direction. Well, what's negative right? Left. Is it wrong? No, it's left. Okay, it's left. So that's another principle that you can take to the bank. Whenever the test charge, the Captain Kirk, the thing that's being pushed, is negative, the force will be opposite the electric field that's pushing it. Say that one more time. Whenever the test charge, the thing that's being pushed, is negative, the force will be opposite the field that's pushing it. Because if I take a field to the right and multiply by a negative number, I get a vector to the left. Okay, if you take a vector and multiply it by a negative number, you change its direction by 180 degrees. Are we on the bus? Now in this case, Q1, first of all, Q2 has done its job. The first step of this two-step dance was for Q2 to set up a field. It's done that, so we don't need it anymore. The field is going to push on this Q1, and Q1 is positive. Since it's a positive test charge, the force is in the same direction as the field. Well, think about it. The field is how hard a plus one Coulomb would be put at that location. If I've got a different positive charge, just a different size positive charge, it's still going to be pushed in the same direction, right? So the force would be to the right. And the size would be given by this definition of electric field. And that would give me 4 <coughs> times 10 to the minus 6 newtons to the right. Okay? Check that your neighbor's on the bus. We're about to do this again. If your neighbor didn't quite understand, we got one more kick at this can, and then the can's forever done. Okay? Okay. It was just pointed out that these forces that were calculated are very, very teeny tiny. And yet we have to remember that typically we're pushing on a proton or an electron. And a proton has a mass of 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. A, an electron has a mass of 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And so we end up with huge accelerations with these size forces. Okay? Now, let's go to part C. This should be obvious after parts A and B. What is the electric field strength, listen carefully, at the location of Q2 due to Q1? Which charge do we care about? Q1. Yes, this time it's Q1. Putting an elephant at that location of Q2 does not change the problem. It's just a location we care about. The elephant is a placeholder. Now notice what just happened. In part A, Q2 was the Klingon. In part C, now that we're caring about the force on the other chart, Q1 is the Klingon. They trade off in the role that they play in this little uh, feature film. Okay? So, I replace, it's due to Q1, so I get rid of Q2, I get rid of the elephant, and I just put an X there to represent the address, the location. Now, my source is a positive source. The electric field that it creates over here at the X is going to point away 
away from the positive, which would be to the right. And now when I use this formula here to find the size, I would put Q1 in here. The size of Q1 is half the magnitude of Q2, so it shouldn't surprise me that I get a field that's only half as big. Okay? Now, again, that was just the first step of the two-step dance. We're looking for the force on Q2. We started by letting Q1 create a field. And now that field <coughs> is going to push or pull on Q2, and that's part D. Part D asks, what, far, what force, not farce, it's real, what force does Q2 experience? Okay? Again, Q1 has done its job. It set up the field. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We put that Q2 there, and it's a negative Q2. What direction will the force point if the electric field is pointing right and the test charge is negative? Left. Left. It'll point in the negative right direction, which is left. Okay? Again, think of it in terms of the electric field. The electric field, if you think about it, is the force I would have if I put a plus one coulomb there. Well, if a plus one is pushed this way, wouldn't a negative charge be pulled the other way? Okay? So, the size of that is now given by the definition of the electric field. Notice that I did not put a minus sign in there. I already know the direction. I used my gut to give the direct, get the direction. I'm just looking for the magnitude. And the magnitude is 4 times 10 to the minus 6 to the left. Okay, we just went through the process twice. Once finding the force that Q2 put on Q1, and one finding the force that Q1 put on Q2. Okay, see if your neighbor's on the bus, please. Do a buddy check. I love it. I love the lecture. Let me let me summarize the first four parts of this handout. What I found is that the electric field due to Q2 over here was 1350 newtons per coulomb to the right. The electric field due to Q1 over here was 675 newtons for each coulomb to the right. These electric fields are equal and opposite by what law? Equal. <laughs> They're not equal. They're not opposite. And that's my point. There is no Newton's third law for fields. Newton's third law applies to forces, honest to goodness pushes and pulls. And when we found the force that was acting on charge two, it was that big to the left. When we found the force that was acting on Q1, it was the same size to the right. And we would label these, this is two pulling on one. This is one pulling on two. They are equal and opposite by Newton's third law. Always. Always. You can't make them not equal. If Q2 was positive, if Q2 was positive, uh, if Q2 was positive, then these forces would be repulsive forces but they would both be in the opposite direction. And so you would still have them equal and opposite. Okay, other questions?
Okay, let's do something completely different. Something completely different. Now, I have here a Van de Graaff generator. You've all played with those, I'm sure. It's one of the simplest devices ever made, uh, if you understand it. Um, all it is is a hollow metal ball, and there's a rubber band that rolls on a, uh, a track. Now that rubber band, as it goes around, carries charge. There's two other very important parts of this device. <coughs> Down in the box, there's a metal comb with very sharp points. We're going to find next week that near a sharp point, we have very high, strong electric fields. Strong enough that we can actually take electrons and throw them across space onto this rubber band. Now the rubber band is an insulator or a conductor? An insulator. And that means when the rubber band uh, when the electron hits the rubber band, it's stuck where it hits. It can't move. It's stuck right there. And then the rubber band, as it's rolling around, brings it up into this metal ball. Up in the metal ball, there's another, a second metal cone with sharp points, creating electric fields that are strong enough to rip the electron off of the rubber band and put it onto the ball. Now once those electrons are put on the inside of the ball, they want to get apart from each other. So they move to the outside of the ball. And indeed, they find that they can get further away from each other if they move down this metal cord onto this metal plate. Now what that does is it charges this metal plate negatively. Too many electrons, okay? Now I've got a chamber here the chamber has a metal top and a metal bottom, but it's held apart. They're held apart by plexiglass, a non-conductor. Now, if I'm dumping a bunch of electrons onto this top plate, where are those electrons coming from? Do I have an electron generator in this box? No. I'm getting those electrons from the bottom plate. I'm dragging them off of the bottom plate through this ground wire here, and then they're shoved onto the rubber band, brought up here to the ball, and brought over here. So that means for every single electron that shows up here, I'm missing an electron down there. So this is gonna get charged negatively, the bottom's gonna get charged positively. Now, leave that alone for just a minute. What if in this room I were to paint the floor with positively charged paint. Everywhere in the room I, ch I paint with positively charged paint. What direction would the electric field in this room point due to that positive charge? Up, away from the positive charge. Now, what if I charged the ceiling negatively by painting it with negative paint? What direction would the electric field in, this, in the room point due to the charge on the ceiling? up towards a negative source. Now, if my, if my floor is positive and my ceiling is negative, I have two fields, one due to the floor and one due to the ceiling, acting up. And that gives me a total field due to both up. Okay. Now, I'm charging up that chamber, negative on top, positive on bottom. That's the same if I just started painting the floor positive and the ceiling negative. Now I have here a metal ball. It's actually a ping pong ball that has been uh, painted with metallic paint. And it's neutral. How do I know that it's neutral? Because it's being held by a fat man, okay? The ball is a conductor. The fat man is a conductor. If there was excess charge on this ball, it would want to get away from each other. And the best way to do that would be to get on the great big man. Okay, so by holding this, I neutralize it. Now, if I take that neutral metal ball and I put it in this chamber, Now, 
I'm going to turn off the bandograph. Okay. <laughs> what just happened? Oh, that was cool. <laughs> My metal ball was neutral. And then it landed on this metal plate on the, on the floor of my chamber that was positive. What charge did this acquire? Positive. positive. And so now it's a positive charge in an electric field that points up. What direction is the force on a positive charge in a field that's up? Up. up. So it goes racing up and it hits the ceiling. When it hits the negative ceiling, it becomes negative. negative. Now, what direction is the force on a negative charge in a field that is up? Down. Down. And so it's pushed down to the floor. When it hits the floor, it becomes positive. Now it feels a force up. It goes, hits the ceiling, becomes negative, and now it push, is pushed down. Up and down, up and down, up and down. It could go forever as long as I kept replenishing the charge on the plates. When I turned off the Van de Graaff, I stopped moving charge electrons from the bottom plate to the top plate. So now, it just had a fixed amount of charge. Now each time the ball goes up and down, it's carrying electrons from the top plate to the bottom plate. And if it keeps doing that over and over again, eventually it's going to neutralize both plates, and then it stops bouncing. Okay, then. See if your neighbor just understood that demo. See if they... What happens if you just leave it on? It just goes on forever and ever and ever. Without the ball. Oh, without the ball. Uh, eventually, you didn't have a charge. Um, if you didn't have it leaking off, you throw, throw a spark and it out. But my experience has been that that's too big a gap, and you leak out to the atmosphere before you can throw that big a spark. Um, that's not the way we do the, the up and down, but we could. Okay, folks, the purpose of this demo is to get us ready for part E. We're asked, what is the electric field at the midpoint between these two charges, Q1 and Q2, due to both charges? Now, folks, this formula for electric field only has place for one charge. I'm looking for the electric field at this location due to Q1 and Q2. What do I do? Do I add them together? Do I average them? Do I subtract them? Do I multiply them each by pi and divide by four? What? Since they're vectors, we can just add them. Ah. Each of these is going to give me an electric field that is a vector, and we just add those vectors. In other words, we use superposition. We admit that we can only solve a problem with one source at a time. So what we do is we first of all, we first of all pretend that Q2 does not exist. And we calculate the electric field due to Q1 alone. And so in this formula, I would put Q1. And it's to the right because it's away from the positive source. The next thing I would do is I would pretend that Q1 doesn't exist, that the only source is Q2, and I would find the electric field at that x due to Q2. Notice that it's twice as big because the magnitude of that charge is twice as big. And it's to the right because it's towards a negative source. And then, once I found the electric field due to each part, I add them together to get the total. When we were talking about the electric field in the room due to the floor and the ceiling, we had a field up due to the floor, 
we had a field up due to the ceiling, the total field was the sum of both. In the chamber, we have a field up due to the positive bottom plate. We have a field up due to the negative top plate. We have a total field that is the sum. Superposition is the one theme that's going to transcend all the boundaries in this class, in this semester. We used it when we had two pulses that were approaching each other on a spring. We're going to use it over and over and over again with electric fields and forces. Okay? Long ago, I used, to, I used to make a joke of this and I'd say, you know, if you've got a problem you can't solve, you stand up and you say, hi, my name's Greg Francis, I've got a problem. You know, kind of mocking the, the AA meetings and, uh, and, and talking about how you take the big problem, break it up into small problems. Well, it got back to me about uh, five months later that at every AA meeting in Bozeman, people were getting up and saying, hi, I'm Greg Francis, I've got a problem. And then everyone would laugh, because they'd all taken my class. <laughs> I don't know if I was driving them to drink or what. <laughs> anyway, so I stopped. I don't do that anymore. Okay. Now, if we calculate those individual fields, the field due to uh, Q1, notice I put Q1 in here, and notice also that the distance now is 10 centimeters, not 20 centimeters, because it's always the distance from the source to the X, where I'm finding the field, and that's only half the distance. I find 2,700 newtons for each coulomb. When I do it for each, uh, Q2, notice I don't put the minus sign there. And notice because my charge is twice the magnitude, I get a field that's twice the magnitude, or 5,400 newtons for each coulomb. Since they're both pointing the same direction, I add them, and I get 8,100 newtons for each coulomb. Okay, is it making sense? Is it all coming together? Now, once I have that field at the center point, I can put a test charge there, a Q3, if you will. In this case, we happen to put a negative test charge. But Q1 and Q2 have done their job. They did the first step of this two-step dance. They created the field. Now we don't need them. Okay, we get rid of them, and we just worry about the force, the actual push, that's exerted on this negative test charge, this negative Captain Kirk. Now, if the field is to the right, and the test charge that's being pushed is negative, then the push, the actual force, is in the negative right direction, or the left direction, it would be opposite the electric field. Opposite. Okay? And the size would be given by the, op the definition of the electric field. Notice I don't put the minus sign here because I already know the direction. I just want to know the magnitude, always a positive quantity. And I get 0 .00, I'm sorry, 0 0.016 newton. Okay, I hope some of you are bored. I hope most of you are bored. Now, um, let's skip the last part here. Okay. Let's see if we understand. Two point charges, plus Q and minus Q, are fixed in place. A distance 2D apart is shown. Now, folks, typically, we're going to take our Klingons, our sources, and we're going to nail them to the table, or we're going to super glue them to the table, so that they don't get pushed and change the problem. Okay? So in this case, they're fixed at those locations, and we're asked what is the direction of the electric field at the midpoint between the charges. Now student two says, 
I think we've all come to realize that student one is always wrong, but student two sometimes is right. The electric field is given by this Coulomb's law, so if I do the calculation with my calculator, I get a positive contribution here and a negative contribution here, so the electric field is zero at the midpoint. What do you think? Mm. Wrong or sick and wrong? Sick and wrong. Sick and wrong. That student is misinterpreting the minus sign. The minus sign doesn't mean right or left. The minus sign means towards. The plus sign means away. And typically, we ignore the minus sign and just use our gut. And so, since I've got an electric field away from the positive, that would be to the right. An electric field towards the negative, that would be to the right. They would add. They would not subtract. Okay, with your clicker, I have two identical positive charges, A and B, and they're fixed in place at these locations. The distance from point C, location C, to charge A is twice the distance, twice the distance as from location C to charge B. What's at the X? Nothing. Empty space. Okay? We pretend there's one Coulomb when we're finding the electric field, but in truth there's nothing but empty space. The X is a placeholder, a, an address, a mailbox. Now, which of those directions gives the direction of the electric field at point C with your clicker, people? contribution to this positive source, it will be away, and because it's twice as far, the effect will be one-fourth as great, and so the electric field will be one-fourth the size as that due to B. The total will be like that, or C. Now, folks, I have two minutes left. With those two minutes, I'm going to help you with your tutorial homework. These are important two minutes. This formula, Coulomb's Law, only applies when your source, your Klingon, is concentrated in a, in a small location, at a point. If you have charge that is smeared over a larger area, like this hemispherical rod, what you can do is break it up into chunks, like chunky peanut butter. And in this case, I broke it up into nine chunks. You could break it up into a thousand and one, if you're bored but nine is enough. Each of those chunks has one ninth of the total charge. Okay? Now, if I want the electric field at the X due to all of this charge, I just use superposition. That's the electric field due to that one. That's the electric field due to that one. As I move around the, the hemisphere, I get that contribution, that one, that one's due to the one at the bottom. Okay. Now, if each one of these contributions is five newtons for each coulomb, I just made that number up, and I've got nine of them, do I just take nine times five to get 45 is my answer? No. No, because some of them are fighting each other. If I were to add these two contributions, this one gives me that one, and this one gives me that one, I get zero. They're opposite directions. If I were to add these two contributions, this one due to that one, 
this one due to that, that one, I get almost zero because they're mostly in the opposite direction. If I look at those two, I get something bigger than zero, and those two even bigger, and that's the one on the bottom. And you see that total is, is less than if I had all of that charge at one location. If I were to scrape all of this charge down into one glob, I can think of that glob as being nine globs, each giving me five newtons for each coulomb. Since they're all giving me contributions in the same direction, now nine times five is 45. So I get a bigger feel when all of the charge is concentrated than when it's spread out over a region. Okay, that's all the time we've got. We'll see you on Friday.